uh, so far, what we have been doing was about a single language, only English, when we were doing language modeling. Today, we are going to try to extend that to multiple languages or cross-lingual language modeling. And again, we want to stick to the pre-training and then fine-tuning paradigm. It's similar to BERT. Now we want to extend it to multiple languages. You're going to have multiple languages and uh, you're going to have cross-lingual pre-training. So far, what we were doing was only single languages or single, uh, you had a single corpus for English, for instance. Now we want to do cross-lingual pre-training and then we have some downstream tasks for each language specifically. XLM is going to stand for cross-lingual language models. We are going to have monolingual data or parallel data. For monolingual data, you have N monolingual corpora. So these are dif different. For instance, CI could be the corpus for English uh, or the corpus for French, Spanish, etc. And you have N monolingual corpuses. And that's going to be an unsupervised task. You can make your life a little easier by having parallel data. So you have pairs of English and French data that's going to become supervised. So it could be either unsupervised or supervised. We have N monolingual corpora. And then let's say NI is the number of sentences in each of those corpuses. In CI, its size is NI. You could have unsupervised which is that you don't have pairs of translations from English to French, from English to uh, Spanish, etc. Or you could have parallel data. The first one is unsupervised. The second one is going to be supervised. First thing first, you're going to need to say what is your vocabulary and how do you want to come up with. We know about byte pair encoding. Now we are going to apply it on uh, pairs of languages or on all of these corpuses. So we are going to have a single core vocabulary for the entire uh, data. So we are going to have a shared vocabulary. We are going to use byte pair encoding. And how do you come up with your data sentences to train this? And how do you learn your byte pair encoded uh, splits? You're going to concatenate sentences. So you're going to sample a sentence from English. You're going to sample a random sentence from French, concatenate them together. And then that's going to give you your sentences that you're going to use to train the sub words in your byte pair encoding. So these are your byte pair encoded sub words. Now the question is how are you going to sample? And with what probability are you going to sample from the first corpus? With what, what probability are you going to sample from the second corpus, etc.? So you're going to sample according to a multinomial distribution with probabilities QI. So with probability Q1, you're going to sample a sentence from C1. With probability Q2, you're going to sample a sentence from C2, corpus 2, etc. Okay. And uh, one idea for QI is that you're going to look at the size of your corpus. Let's say alpha is 1 for now. You're going to look at the size of corpus I. You're going to divide it by the entire number of uh, the, the entire size of your corpuses. So it's going to be the total number of sentences, regardless of the corpus. And that's going to give you PI. So P1, P2, P3, P4. And these are going to add up to 1. You could sample according to that. But then if a language has more data in it, if a corpus for a particular language like English has more data, there is bias towards that language. To remove the bias, you're going to take the square root of these PIs. But once you take the square root, they're not going to add up to 1 anymore. So you're going to force them to add up to 1. This is the square root of pi, the summation of over j of a square root of pj's. Now qi's are going to add up to 1. And this way, you are removing the bias towards high resource languages, such as English, French, etc. OK, so far, so good. And then you're going to apply by pair encoding on these concatenated sentences. And that's going to give you your subwords. So it's going to be a shared sub vocabulary for the entire uh, language, human language, whatever that is. Let it be English, French, whatever. Now, now that you know your vocabulary, what are you going to do? You're going to apply a language model to it. You can have causal language modeling. 
and this was predict an X word. So these were AR models, autoregressive models, and these are the decoder part of your transformer. You could apply a masked language modeling framework like BERT. Now, the only catch here is, uh, first of all, you have your token embeddings. These are coming out of your byte pair encoded. You're gonna then uh, need to know what position you're at, and then you're gonna need to know what language. This data is coming from what language. So you're gonna have a language embedding. So if you are processing a sentence in English, you're gonna have a vector corresponding to English here. If you are processing a sentence in French, you're gonna have French here. And then it's gonna be masked. Wherever you have a mask, you're gonna predict it. And then you're gonna train that over the entire corpus, all of your cor corpora. This is good. This is when you have monolingual data. This is unsupervised. The supervised here means that you have pairs of translations. If you have that, that's a luxury and you can use that. And that's gonna be called TLM. So we had CLM, MLM, and TLM. This is translation language modeling. Here you have pairs of sentences in English and French, and then you can fit the entire thing inside your transformer and then predict some words in English and some words in French, and then you can train it. What is the downstream task? You could have a natural language inference in 15 different languages. So that's a data set that I want you to explore. It is X and a lie. For instance, your task could be in French. There is a pair, there are, there is a pair of sentences in French. And the question is, uh, are they logically following each other? Are they contradiction or they are neutral? But your sentences are in French. What can you do? You have a bunch of data now. This is, remember, this is now the fine tuning. This is the downstream task. You have pairs of sentences in French, and let's say you have a training data for that. What you can do is you can translate your training data into English. Now your training data is now in English. You train your, you fine tune your natural, uh, your cross-lingual language model or your language model for that task in English, and then you can use that. So the first obvious benchmark is that you're gonna translate your sentences to English, solve your problem in English, and then come back. The other one is that you already have a good natural language inference uh, framework trained on English data. So you can, now somebody gives you a test data. What you can do is you can translate your test to English, so solve your problem in English, and then report your results. So one of them is operating on the training data. One of them is operating on the test data. These are gonna give you some baselines to work with, or you can solve the task in its own language because now you're doing a transfer learning. You're doing some transfer from English, some transfer from French, and then you're transferring some information to a Spanish, okay? So now all of these uh, languages are talking to each other through this uh, pre-training. And then it turns out that if you have the luxury of having pairs of, data or parallel data, it being supervised, then you're gonna get the best results in terms of accuracy. And the second best are uh, if you don't have TLM. That is for natural language inference. You can solve some translation for translation, machine translation. For some of these languages, you don't have pairs of data or that much pairs of data. Can you go to the extreme and have no translation at all? And uh, this is gonna be called unsupervised machine translation. So yes, you can do unsupervised machine translation. By unsupervised, I mean, uh, it's just, you use your language model and just apply it for the task of translation. And uh, you can have different types of embeddings actually doing transfer learning. You can do your transfer learning on the encoder side. You can do your transfer learning on the decoder side. If you start with word embeddings, that's gonna give you that performance in terms of blue. If you start random, initially everything is random, that's your performance, so it's very bad. If you do CLM on the decoder part, your performance starts to improve. If you do MLM on the decoder part, you're gonna improve. If you do CLM on the encoder, you're gonna have a little bit of drop 
in performance. And remember, if this is uh, blank, it means that those embeddings, you are not doing any transfer learning. So everything is going to start randomly, and then you're going to train. And then you can do some transfer learning, CLM, 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 MLM, and the best one is MLM, MLM. It's performing the best for translation. So these are our downstream tasks. So your downstream task could be supervised machine translation, but now this is a low resource language, Romanian. And you can have another low resource language, and now you can improve the perplexity of Nepalese and uh, by training Nepali, English, and Hindi. The big ideas are this shared subword vocabulary, the way that you're going to sample to remove the bias towards high resource languages, but the rest of it, and the other one is these embeddings, language embeddings. The rest of it is uh, the same paradigm of pre-training fine tuning. So basically you're extending BERT or GPT type models, GPT-1, not GPT-2, to uh, multiple languages and cross-lingual models. Any questions? Okay, in that case, let's move to the next.